Hi and welcome back to Free Science Lessons. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe how the loop of Henle and the collecting duct work together to produce concentrated urine. And if you're following the Edexcel spec, you should be able to describe how the kidney of the kangaroo rat is adapted for life in a dry environment. Okay, I'm showing you here a diagram of the nephron, and remember that humans have around 1.5 million nephrons in each kidney. Remember that ultrafiltration takes place in the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule, and reabsorption takes place in the proximal convoluted tubule. The fluid in the tubule now makes its way through the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. And once it passes out of the collecting duct, we now refer to the fluid as urine. Now there is a problem here. At the end of the proximal convoluted tubule, the fluid in the tubule has the same water potential as the blood. In other words, the fluid contains a relatively high concentration of water. Now, if this fluid was released as urine, then we would produce a very large volume of very dilute urine, and that would be lethal. So, the loop of Henle and the collecting duct work together to reabsorb water from the fluid before it forms urine. And this allows us to produce a relatively small volume of concentrated urine. Now, in the next video, we look at how humans control the volume of urine that we produce. That process is called osmoregulation, and it involves the hormone ADH. But in this video, we're looking at how the loop of Henle and the collecting duct function. I'm showing you here the loop of Henle and the collecting duct. Both of these extend down into the medulla of the kidney. Now I'm going to start by looking at what happens in very simple terms. The job of the loop of Henle is to lower the water potential of the tissue in the medulla. As the fluid moves down the collecting duct, water now moves from the fluid into the medulla by osmosis. This water is then reabsorbed back into the blood. And this allows us to produce concentrated urine. So you need to remember that the job of the loop of Henle is to lower the water potential in the medulla. Okay, now the loop of Henle has two regions. First, fluid moves down the descending limb. The descending limb is thin-walled and is very permeable to water. The fluid then turns around the bottom of the loop and makes its way up the ascending limb. The ascending limb is thick-walled and is impermeable to water. In between the limbs, we have the interstitial region. Now, in order to explain how the loop of Henle works, we need to look at the ascending limb first. As the fluid moves up the ascending limb, sodium ions and chloride ions are pumped out of the fluid by active transport, and these ions are transferred into the interstitial region. Now, active transport requires energy in the form of ATP. And this ATP is provided by mitochondria in the cells of the ascending limb. Now, the walls of the ascending limb are impermeable to water, so water cannot leave the fluid in the ascending limb. Okay, so because of the ascending limb, we now have a high concentration of sodium ions and chloride ions in the interstitial space. And this means that the medulla has a very low water potential. Now, based purely on what I've just said, it looks as though the loop of Henle has done its job. We have created a very low water potential in the medulla, which allows water to be reabsorbed from the collecting duct by osmosis. However, you need to bear in mind that active transport requires a great deal of energy. So the loop of Henle has an adaptation which reduces the amount of energy needed. To understand this, we need to look at the fluid moving down the descending limb. Initially, this fluid has the same water potential as the blood. In other words, a relatively high concentration of water and a relatively low concentration of ions. However, unlike the ascending limb, the walls of the descending limb are very permeable to water. So as the descending limb passes down into the medulla with its low water potential, water moves out of the fluid and into the medulla by osmosis. The water then moves by osmosis into the blood and is carried away. So as the fluid makes its way down the descending limb, it loses water and becomes progressively more concentrated. So at the bottom of the loop, the fluid is now a relatively concentrated solution. 
Now, this has an impact on the ascending limb. When this concentrated fluid starts moving up the ascending limb, the concentration is so high that sodium ions and chloride ions can move out of the fluid by diffusion. Then, further up the ascending limb, active transport takes over, pumping sodium ions and chloride ions out of the fluid as we saw before. So because the fluid becomes more concentrated moving down the descending limb, it makes the transfer of sodium ions and chloride ions more efficient in the ascending limb. And this creates an extremely low water potential in the medulla. Now, scientists refer to this as a countercurrent multiplier. Countercurrent refers to the fact that the fluid is moving down the descending limb and up the ascending limb. In other words, in opposite directions. And this is a multiplier because the efficiency of ion transfer out of the fluid in the ascending limb is amplified by the transfer of water out of the fluid in the descending limb. Now, as we saw before, the low water potential of the medulla means that water moves out of the fluid by osmosis as it passes down the collecting duct. And this allows humans to produce a small volume of concentrated urine. I'm showing you here the kangaroo rat, which lives in arid areas of North America. Water is very scarce in this environment. So kangaroo rats conserve water by producing a very small volume of urine. And the urine produced by kangaroo rats is around 20 times more concentrated than the urine produced by humans. Now, the loops of Henle in kangaroo rats are extremely long. This allows kangaroo rats to produce a very low water potential in the medulla of their kidneys, and this allows them to reabsorb a very large amount of water. Now, before we finish, I'd like to look at what happens in the distal convoluted tubule. In the distal convoluted tubule, substances can also be reabsorbed from the fluid passing through. For example, the pH of the blood can be adjusted by absorbing hydrogen ions. Other ions, such as potassium, can also be reabsorbed. And the distal convoluted tubule also plays a role in water reabsorption. In the next video, we look at osmoregulation.